In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, just a few years ago, I was fortunate to go to Kefalonia, the island of my grandfather, with a group of youth from Ionian village, and we visited the monastery of St. Gerasimos. And at the conclusion of uh, our stay there, I asked one of the nuns if I could be blessed with one of the slippers and I told her that my grandfather was from the island, and she gave me the slipper. And people who know about this slipper, it's hard to get a slipper from these people. It's not easy. And uh, she just gave it to me. And so it's here, and it's um, a beautiful gift. What they do is they put the slipper on the body of St. Eurasimus. His body's incorrupt. He, he died in the 16th century. And to even to this day, his body is in, enshrined there in, in a coffin in, in the church. And you can go underneath the church. There's actually a cave where he lived. You climb down this ladder, and you can go through this small hole into this cave and be where the, he was in prayer. We don't have any writings of St. Gerasimus, but we do know about his life. And his story is that he first went, uh, had a calling to become a monk and went to Mount Athos. And he stayed there for about five years. And we're told that from the very beginning, he had this, this grace of God that the demons we reacted to. And the story goes that we believe he went to uh, Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. And he himself went out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights just like our Lord did, and ate nothing during that time. And then he, he is gifted with this ability to, to just um, exercise demons and to perform healings. And there's several stories of these healings to this day that take place at that monastery. And the, the uh, icon that I have in the slippers, icon of St. Gerasimus, I bought that from that monastery many years ago, my first trip there with my family, probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. This morning, it's myrrhing. Icon is emitting a myrrh. And that's the first time that has happened. And of course, it's a Sunday, Feast of the Lord. And the Lord is giving us a gift today of His presence. Also fitting, I believe, is the gospel for today about these two demoniacs. In today's gospel, we just hear about the worst one of the two. And, um, and put these two things together for us today. It's rather amazing when people say they don't believe in the evil one, that the devil is a figment of our imagination. But we know from the presence of Christ on earth that these demons, when they came into his presence, acknowledged him as the Son of God because their, his presence was tormenting to them because they thought when they saw the Lord God Almighty that it was time for their torment, for their judgment, which will happen at the second coming of Christ. And so these demons are speaking outward, outwardly so everyone can hear them. Why are you here tormenting us before our time? And our Lord immediately starts a dialogue with these demons. Not that there's a negotiation going on here at all. He's the Lord of Lords. He can do anything with these demons. But he allows this dialogue to take place so that we can hear it and understand what's going on. They ask him not to torment them, not to send them into the abyss of, of Hades, but to allow them to go into the, the herd of swine. So there happened to be 2,000, we believe, swine there in this giant herd. And of course, a whole bunch of shepherds manning these, these swine. And they asked to go into them. And so immediately he says, yes, depart. And these demons immediately th throw these demons, the swine into the lake, and they drown. You can only imagine seeing 2,000 swine throw themselves into a lake and drown themselves. It had to be a horrifying event. But there's so much we can learn from this. 
First of all, the fact that this man who was running around with no clothes on, who was chained up at times and then would free himself because of his, his strength and would just be roaming around terrifying everyone, that these demons were so present in him that everyone knew it. But they weren't allowed to kill him. In God's providence, he didn't allow them to, to kill him, but to bring him to the edge. And so we see this with the swine. He just allows them to do what they do, which is destruct and uh, destroy God's creation. And, and so the man somehow was protected by God's grace. And when he's freed, all of the herdsmen go running into the city to tell everyone, oh my gosh, something horrific has just happened. All of our swine, all of our livelihood, has been destroyed by this man. And it had something to do, we think, with this man who was possessed. And so they come to him, and when they come to the Lord, they ask him to leave, to depart from them. They want nothing to do with him. And the man, who is now clothed and in his right mind, asks Jesus, take me with you. Think of that. He's asking him to take him with them and not leave him with these people in this city. Why? Because he knows how corrupt they are, but they don't know it. They can't see it. And our Lord does something amazing. He says, no, you're going to stay here. You're going to preach to these people the truth about what God has done to you, and how you've been freed from these demons. And so it illustrates two types of demonic possession. The one that's very obvious in this, these two men, and the one not obvious, and the one that's actually much more dangerous. For these people thought they were fine. There was nothing wrong with them. And, the, and we have a term, we, we always have a Greek term for something. The Greek term is plani, and I think in Russian it's preles, means being spiritually deceived. It means thinking that we're with God, but in actuality we're not with God. And sort of the, the um, terrifying thing of that is that we might not know it. We might not even know it. We think we're in His grace, but we're really not. And so this whole city is a testimony to that, that they, this, this, this man who had been terrifying them for, for ages was finally put in his right man, mind, and no one saw it as something to give glory to God for, because they didn't want to change their life in any way. And they had made idols of everything in their life. And, and when we make idols of things, in other words, the swine and, and the way of life that they were living, they were comfortable with that, and that was all they wanted in life. Even though they have this revelation of the presence of evil through this incredible miracle. And so what are we to do? What if we're not sure in our own life how the demons are, are affecting us in some way? This book by... Um, St. Porphyrios, it's Wounded by Love is what it's called, and it's really a beautiful book because his approach to dealing with evil is very simple, and it goes very well with today's epistle lesson from St. Paul. He says, don't fight the evil. Don't try to, you know, uh, fight even, he says, your passions. He says, what you have to protect is your heart. And you have to open your heart to God and to God's love. He says the way in which we fight evil is by filling our life with the presence of Christ through prayer. And if we, as what he's saying is, if we become essentially living temples, or actually the, in the Greek it's actually temples that have been enlivened, enlivened by the presence of God, there's nothing that can harm us. Don't give 
the evil one any credit. And if you see a demon, which many monks, Father Jacob was sharing with me, they go to Mount Athos, they check into the cell, and the demons show up. They actually are visible. And some monks decide to fight them, and other monks have pity upon them. And they remember, what is a demon? A demon was originally an angel, created by God to give God glory, who left their divine appointment and disobeyed God. And the angels who stayed, the obedient angels, were the ones lead, led by Archangel Michael, who says, let us stand, let us stand firm. Let us not depart from our obedience to God. And so the, the monks could actually have pity upon the demon and think nothing of it. And so how important it is that we understand ourselves as temples that are enlivened by the spirit and grace of God. This is our life and this is our protection. And this is why we come to church and sing these beautiful hymns this is why we come to church and receive the body and blood of Christ so that we may be filled as his temple. And, and if we're not feeling it, if we're not experiencing it, it means we have to depart from doing evil. If, if you, uh, whatever you water grows, St. Porfirio says, and if we water our life of virtue, and developing holiness in our lives, that's what's going to grow. And if we decide to water sin and let that grow, that's going to take over. But he says, let the goodness that is inside all of us, let that prevail and ignore the old Adam. Let the new Adam that we've been given through Christ in our baptism prevail. Let that be the king of who we are. There was a, a story of a, a priest who was visiting St. Yerasimus' monastery many years afterwards, who was in the altar, who's from Mount Athos. He was in the altar praying the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And it is said that during the liturgy, someone brought in someone who was possessed. And the person started crying out, Oh, St. Yerasimus, why are you torturing us? Tell that monk to stop praying on his rope. Tell him to stop. And the people heard it and they, they saw what was going on. And this, the, for the monk in the altar said, I have to pray my rope even harder now. And the, eventually the demon came out of this woman. He didn't confront the evil one. He prayed to Christ and allowed Christ to do what only Christ's presence can do. And, and abolish evil. So this is a, a beautiful and horrifying gospel for us today. And, and may we keep faithful to what the church is calling us how to live our lives. There is salvation. There is life. People say, you know, who would, uh, who would allow 2,000, who would give 2,000, swine, let's just call it, I don't know, a money, put a number on it. Who would give $20,000 to save two people? And the opposite. <laughs> um, if two people were uh, uh, possessed by demons, what, what, would, what would it cost to free them? In many ways, this is the mission of the church. We don't think of it that way, but the mission of the church is to, to save people from death, to save us from the evil one. And when you give your stewardship, when you become a steward of the church, that's what our, our mission is. And our fruit, the thing we're producing, actually is produced through the grace of God, is holiness. That's what the church is all about. And so we do that all the time. We do. We'll sacrifice whatever we can so that God's kingdom may save us from death and from the evil one and that his kingdom may prevail in these temples that he's blessed us with. To him be given glory. Amen. You 
descended from on high, O compassionate one, you submitted to a three-day burial, that you might free us from our passions, O oh, 